Welcome again, everybody, to the November meeting of the Naples chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. My name is Andy Nakarado. I am the president and programs chair, and I'm joined with several other board members tonight. We have Connie Nagel. She's our membership chair, Karen Allman, secretary and outreach, and Becky Troop, who is our treasurer. And have several special guests this evening. Um, as I go through the announcements, I'll have a, a couple of shout outs along the way. Uh, but after our announcements, we'll come to our feature presentation, Restoration of the Naples Preserve with Becky Spear, Recreation Assistant for the City of Naples at the Naples Preserve. So if you haven't already, um, for the sake of our recording, uh, could you please turn off your cameras and your microphones for the duration of our meeting and feature presentation. If you have a chat, you can feel free to type your question into the chat at any time. And at the end of Becky's feature presentation, uh, we will address as many questions as possible. And as a reminder, we are recording the presentation, so anybody who wasn't able to join live will be able to watch the video on the Naples Native Plants YouTube channel. And uh, closed captions are available on those videos in multiple languages. I would like to recognize the business members for the Naples chapter. We have BB Florida Friendly, Landert Landscape Design, Naples Botanical Garden, and Cypress Cove Land Keepers, who you will hear more about shortly. First though, it's that time of year when we announce our slate of nominees for next year's Board of Directors for the Naples chapter. And you can see we have uh, many nominees for 2022, um, but nobody is competing against each other. There are several co-chair positions, as you can see. Um, but starting from the top, our nominee for vice president is Maureen McFarland, secretary Leslie Landert, treasurer Beth Courtright, who's here with us tonight, and two conservation co-chairs in Liberty Gibson and David Cordy. So when it's a co-chair position, that means those two individuals will be working it together um, towards the, the goal of conservation in this case. I am nominated for communications chair, membership chair, Connie Nagel, programs co-chair, Heather Gienap, Outreach and Programs Co-Chair Karen Allman and Outreach Co-Chair B.B. Cantor. And you can see in the very top left corner, President is still open. So if anybody would like to nominate themselves at this time for the President position, we are still taking nominations. Or if you have somebody else in mind who you'd like to nominate for the position, as long as you get their permission, um, you can uh, nominate in the chat if you like, or email us um, a little bit later at naplesnativeplants at fnps.org. And that email address will show up on uh, later slides. So those are our slate of nominees and our voting will occur in early December. So it will be chapter members, so members of the Naples chapter who are eligible to vote in next year's board of directors. And you will receive an online link to vote in the December newsletter. And at that time um, with the link to vote, you'll be able to read bios some brief background for all of the nominees before you vote for them. As I mentioned, all the positions are non-contested, so nobody is competing against each other for a position, although we do have co-chair positions that'll be serving together. So when you're voting, all you have to do is vote a yes or no for each um, nominee in the different positions. And what does it take for somebody to be voted onto the board for next year? 
uh, the nominee needs 51% of voters to vote yes to be elected. So that's 51% of voters, not 51% of the membership. And these are the online voting rules that we formed um, after COVID-19 started and we had to write in our bylaws actually um, how we can vote in board members through an online process. The voting will close on Friday, December 3rd. So from the day that you get the December newsletter, um, that'll be roughly a, a week and a half to get your votes in through that online link. And then the new board will be meeting um, quickly after that date on either December 12th or 13th to be determined. And that is how uh, the online voting of our board of directors will occur. If you have any questions, you can put them into the chat or reach out to us at a later time. Or if you have any nominations for president. Okay, now I'm going to transition and talk about our upcoming community events that I've alluded to. First, we've got the grand opening of the Gore Nature Education Center coming up this Sunday, November 7th from noon to 4 p.m. And we do have uh, several people from the Cypress Cove Landkeepers who are um, organizing the event and they've um, funded the restoration of the, um, the education center itself, the building and the property. Um, so if Christy is here with us, um, is there anything you'd like to say about the grand opening that's coming up? Andy, I'm interrupting. Could everybody turn off their sound? Turn off their sound. They have to mute. Let me take a look if anybody's. It looks to me like everybody is muted. Um, There's a really bad sound coming. Really bad sound. Does anybody else hear a bad like feedback? I'm not getting responses from anybody else. <laughs> Is it sounding better, BB? No. Anybody else, could you put in the chat? Okay, everybody else says it sounds okay. So it may have to do with your um, particular speakers, Phoebe. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so when I was scrolling through, I saw that Christy is here. So Christy, would you like to say a few words about the grand opening? Hi, Andy, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, sorry, my, my laptop died while I was out here, so I had to switch over to my phone. But um, we would love for everyone to come out and check this place out because it's, it's something that we've been working on for a couple of years now, and we think it's great, and we know everyone's going to love it once they come see it too. But um, there's going to be a lot of great people that are community partners that have been so supportive and helpful getting us to where we're at especially Andy, um, with all of her wealth of knowledge that she shared along the way, and a lot of people on the call as well. So we're just excited to bring the community together for an event. I think everyone's really excited to get out again, um, and it's going to be an outdoor event, so it'll be nice and safe for everyone to kind of check out what's going on. And if you can't come out this weekend, please do reach out. We are going to be doing private tours um, and different events for the new year as well. So we're excited to, to show it off and get to uh, finally show everybody what everyone's worked so hard for. Yeah, we're really looking forward to it. And it, uh, you can see for uh, Naples native plants in particular, we will have an outreach table with educational resources. And we're also planning a native plant mystery table that will be fun for kids and adults. That'll be something a little bit new that we're trying for this event specifically. 
So if you are looking for more information about the event, you can visit the Cypress Cove Landkeepers website, and that is cclandkeepers.com. So that is this coming Sunday. We have another event the following weekend, and that will be the Naples Yard and Garden Show, which is put on by the Collier County Master Gardener Volunteers at the Collier County Extension Office which if anybody has not been there, it's off of Immokalee Road on um, very close to the Collier County Fairgrounds and on the way to Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. So this will be a big plant sale with a, a variety of different plant vendors. There is admission for the event. Adults are $5, children under 12 are free. And you can see that you can pay in advance on the event's Eventbrite page. So if you um, just search for Naples Yard and Garden Show, um, it, it'll come up near the top with the Eventbrite page where you can pay in advance. And for Naples native plants, of course, we're going to be uh, the source of native plants at the sale. And we're going to be featuring plenty of drought tolerant species since we're moving into the dry season. And if anybody's interested in volunteering with us, this is always a really fun event. Um, we'll be looking for um, some help with setup, customer assistance, handing out outreach materials, and cleanup on the last day. Um, so the sale itself is Saturday, November 13th, and Sunday, November 14th, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. both days. Um, so we have had um, good responses for volunteers on the setup day, which is actually Friday, November 12th. Um, but if you're available to help volunteer even for a couple hours on that Saturday or Sunday, please do email us at naplesnativeplants at fnps.org and uh, we'll get you signed up to volunteer and we would definitely appreciate it. Now we have a few save the dates looking ahead to December. Our next virtual chapter meeting will be Wednesday, December 1st at 6 p.m. for the social time, just like tonight, 6.30 for the um, start of announcements and the feature presentation. Next month's topic will be Ethnobotany of the Everglades presented by Erica Holler, a ranger at Everglades National Park, the Gulf Coast Visitor Center. So we're looking forward to that next month. And we're also scheduling a field trip to the Naples Preserve for Saturday, December 11th, 9 a.m. And so you'll be hearing about the Naples Preserve tonight and learning a lot about it. And Saturday, December 11th will be an opportunity to visit with fellow native plant lovers. Of course, you can visit the Naples Preserve um, any day of the week during daylight hours, and it is a, a free place to visit. But if you would like to come with the Naples Chapters field trip, um, look at our December newsletter to come out, and that's where the link will be to sign up for the field trip. And we're still uh, promoting the new Florida Native License plate. We're Still working on getting those 3,000 pre-orders so that the plate will be manufactured. And if you're interested in pre-registering for this plate, which the um, proceeds will support the Florida Native Plant Society, you can visit our website, fnpsnaples.org, to pre-register. And if you've never visited our website before, again, fnpsnaples.org. This is a snapshot from our website where you can learn more about us and the events we have coming up. And if you're not already getting our e-newsletter, there's a place where you can subscribe. And that's really the best way to stay up to date with all of the community events, future meetings and field trips. Um, that we'll have going on throughout the season. And if you're um, not already a member and you would like to join, you can do that from our website too. And now the time has come for me to introduce our guest speaker for this evening. 
presenting a restoration of the Naples Preserve will be Becky Spear. And just going to minimize here and I'm going to read Becky's introduction. Rebecca Spear is originally from Milan, Ohio. She grew up on a farm that included traditional crops and a dried flower and herb business. Becky was always outside, either working in the fields or exploring the woods and the river that were on her family farm. A job transfer brought Becky to Naples in 1989. She started as a volunteer at the Naples Preserve in 2008 and later became a member of the staff in 2011. Over the years, Becky has organized nature talks, hosted field trips and summer camps, and engaged countless FGCU students in restoration at the Naples Preserve. She says, who could ask for a better job as I learn something new and fascinating every day? One of Becky's favorite native plants as of late is the showy dawn flower, which you will see in her presentation. However, Becky says her favorite native plant changes over time, depending on which plants attract her notice throughout the year. So with that, I am very excited for um, Becky to share her presentation with everybody tonight. I will stop sharing my screen and I'll turn it over to you, Becky. Right. There we go. Well, welcome to the Naples Preserve, everybody. I know several of you have been here. And thank you for this opportunity for uh, allowing us to share what's going on at the Naples Preserve. So what is the Naples Preserve? Well, let's get a little history lesson right here. It's a little under nine and a half acres. Uh, it went up for sale in the late 1990s. And the people that lived in the area, a lot of them were born here, grew up around this area, went to the city council and said, please, please, please buy this property because it's commercial. We don't want it developed. It's the last green space within the city of Naples. So we, uh, it actually uh, was a ballot. We voted on it and look at three to one, three to one voted. Yes, we should buy this property. So on April 11th in 2000, the city purchased it for a little over $8 million. Okay, now think about that. That was a little over 8 million in 2000. What do you think the price would be today? Especially when you see where we're located. <laughs> so I think this was the third try in 2002. They finally um, got an over $3 million grant from the Florida Communities Trust Program. That's the Florida Forever Fund. So that's state tax money. And because we got this grant, we had, there are several requirements that we must fulfill to keep the grant. Uh, one of them is doing a minimum of 24 educational nature programs every year. So thank you, Native Plant Society, because this is another one we can chalk up as an educational program. And one of the other big things we're required to do is to restore this property to its former um, habitats. And that's what we're currently doing. So this is going to be a long term um, program that we're doing with the restoration. So here's the Naples Preserve. And to try to get your bearings here, there's US 41 Fleshman Boulevard. If this doesn't help, here's some landmarks. Coastland Center Mall, Fleshman Park, Lake Park Neighborhood, and Coquina Sands. And the Lake Park Neighborhood is the one that really uh, push to get this property saved because see it's in the backyard a lot of the kids played in there played in here when they were kids so you can see we are surrounded by urban development so now what do you think the price of this property would be so what is in the naples preserve let's take a look um andy mentioned the habitats that we have so we have the oak rosemary scrub and pine flatwoods so let's take a look at these habitats so the pine flatwoods, this is an example. This 
is where it just says pine flatwoods. This is a dry flatwoods. It is mainly, well, it's the uh, Florida Southern slash pine with an understory of saw palmetto. And then there's some other things in there like beauty berry and stagger bush, shiny blueberries. Then we have the oak rosemary scrub and, and you had the rosemary in the trivia thing. You cannot see the rosemary in here, but it's there in other areas. And then this is going to be where you see on the map, it says grassy meadow, way down on the Southern end. And I'm gonna be talking a lot about this. A lot of our current restoration is going on in that whole area marked uh, that says grassy meadow. This area has had everything happen to it. You know, they, they mowed it, they took things out, people drove their vehicles through it. So this area really does need to be restored. It was, by looking what was there, this was scrubby flatwoods with some scrub mixed in it. So that was the 41 side, <clears throat> excuse me. This is the very south end along 14th Avenue, and we're gonna be seeing a lot of what's been done here. So the property has been saved from development, but is that all we need to do? Will this property be able to sustain itself without us intervening? Now, if this were up north, for instance, on our family farm, we had a large woods. We didn't have to do anything. It takes care of itself. But down here, especially in these habitats, the scrub and the scrubby flatwoods, They've had to adapt to two natural disturbances that we have down here. And I'm sure you're all familiar with them. So the first one of these, so it's not able to sustain itself um, because we have these two natural disturbances. To humans, it's a disaster, but their disturbances and the habitats need them. They adapted to them and now if they don't happen, they just can't sustain themselves. Once a hurricane, we really can't do much about that, but it, it's very helpful to the habitats, but I'm not gonna go into the hurricanes, what they do, but fire, fire is so important. This is the one we're gonna cover. So what does fire do? This is one that humans can um, say yes or no. It's being denied at the preserve and there are a lot of good reasons for that. So, but why do we need fire? Well, this wasn't from a fire, but what a fire do, does is it burns off the understory, gets rid of all the debris. Now this is the, the uh, flatwoods. This is where we first started experimenting with what we were doing. The debris was, see the red bands around the tree trunks? That was the height of the debris. Nothing can grow under that. I mean, why do you mulch a garden? Isn't it to stop things from coming up? So that was one thing. And the bed, that's a bedroll in there from a homeless person, probably from in the 1970s. We could date a lot of the homeless camps because a lot of the beer cans had pull tabs on them. Um, so we have the debris out of here. And the thing is, when we were taking out all that pine straw, we thought we were down to the ground and you know what? We still had several more inches to go. It was so compressed under all this. It was like concrete. We had to use shovels and picks to break it up. The water couldn't even get into the ground. And we know that because of this, the saw palmetto, instead of putting the roots down into the ground, the roots were coming up into the debris to get water. And the same with the slash pines, the roots were coming up into the debris because the water just was not able to get into the ground. Fire would control vines, keep them under control. It, it, fire keeps the balance. You don't want anything taking over. Here you can see the muscadine grape and I can assure you there's um, green briar or I'll be calling it Smilex in, in this mix, can cover the trees, shades the trees so it might die. If there are any Tillandsia, you no know, bromeliads under there, air plants, they're not getting sunlight, they're not getting the rain they need, the fog, so it causes a lot of problems. So I mentioned in the trivia 
that the southern slash pine has two defenses to prevent it from burning. Remember, it wants the understory to burn, but it doesn't want to burn. So let's take a look at one of the defenses. If you look at the bark, it's very, very thin layers that are compressed. Doesn't it look a little bit like a book? If you turn a book, a closed book on the side, you look at all the pages. Have you ever tried to burn a book or a magazine? Doesn't really burn just around the edges. You have to open it up to get the air in there. So this protects the tree. The other protection is look at the photo of the trees. Do you notice anything that might protect them from fire? Where are the branches? Are they down low? They're all up high. The bottom ones die off so that the flames that are on the ground cannot reach the branches. However, if you have a high fuel load, the flames are going to be high enough to reach into the canopy. So that defense is lost. And also, the vines will grow up the trees. And that's nothing but a fuse to take the fire up into the canopy. So the two natural defenses that the tree has are don't work. And then what will happen is you have a catastrophic fire where it kills all the trees. This happened in Picayune. If you uh, go out there around Beck Benfield, go down there. They had a fire there a few years ago, killed all the pines, cypress, everything in there. And now there are nothing but um, there's that ear leaf acacia coming up, which is a really big problem. All these exotics are coming up in there. So, you know, that's what happens when things are uh, let go. A fire also suppresses or prevents succession. You'll see this happen, for instance, in a marsh. You'll have the willow move in and they take it over and it's no longer a marsh. So in the preserve, we have native trees that are planted all around on the streets, you know, streetscape or landscape at people's houses. They are moving into the preserve and changing the scrub and the scrubby flatwoods to hammock. And we'll show you a couple uh, examples here. These are cabbage palms on 10th Street. We have removed these, but let's take a side view. You see how thick they are and they're like in a row? Nothing can grow under them for one thing. But uh, I'm gonna ask you a question here. Can you figure out why those are growing in a row like that? And if you looked, I gave you a hint. Did you see it? Do you notice the power lines above this row of cabbage palms? Well, the birds sit up there. So they're planting cabbage palms underneath. So, you know, don't blame the birds. They're only doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? They're, they're big seed dispersal units, but it's changing this, it's gonna change it. Nothing, none of our plants that need the scrubby flatwoods or the scrub are gonna be able to survive. And this includes animals too. So we'll lose a lot if we let this succession continue. This is that south end that I said I'm gonna be talking a lot about. We do have a slash pine there. There are a few others way in the back, but all these other trees are live oak, cabbage palms. We took the big cabbage palms out. The small ones that are there are now removed. and mahogany coming up in there. Nothing's growing under the live oak or the mahogany. The only thing that's growing there are vines and that's because they can grow up into the trees to uh, reach the sunlight. We have had fire at the preserve. When we were doing some of our restoration areas, we found where there were fires decades ago, but this is the recent one. Do you see the date? Friday, April 13th. Well, this Friday, April 13th, turned out to be good luck, not bad luck. Uh, the culprit that started it was this cabbage palm. It had grown up into the power lines. And by the way, these power lines go to the Coastal and Center Mall. So this wasn't popular that this happened. Um, so people saw this start right away. The fire department, Naples Fire Department, was right there doing their job and put the fire out. Not a lot burned there. There were just a few grasses. There was gopher apple there. So it was mainly just a little bit of ash, sing, singed ground, a little bit of ash. So this was April 13th. I want you to look at what happened a little bit later, what it looked like on June. And 
this photo doesn't even do this justice. It was a sea of blue. It was so beautiful. The white mouth day flower. There were a few of them there before the fire, but just a few. And they weren't nearly the size of what came after the fire. But now there's like a profusion of them. And actually some of them were white. It was that little bit of ash. Ash is the fertilizer. And that is so important. Uh, an important item that a fire provides. Remember, this is sand. And we're actually, the Naples Preserve is actually on an ancient sand dune. Sand doesn't have, I don't know if it has any nutrients in it. If it does, it's very, very few. So this can show, this shows you how important fire is and what that ash can do. So we're in the process of restoring. Let's bring it back, but Are there any challenges with that? Or do we just say, okay, we got a group together, we got time, let's go out and just start cutting things and raking and let's restore this property. Well, it takes a lot of planning and a lot of observation as to what's going on on the property itself. For instance, I'll, I'll show you how we work this. We work from 7.30 in the morning till 12.30, till just afternoon. Why do we do that? Well, it's important, it's, for one thing, it's cooler than, right? It's better for all of us. But in the winter, the tortoises come out about noon because that's when it starts warming up. We don't want to be out there disturbing them. So they will not come out of their burrows and warm out. They will not come out and look for food. So we, we're trying to do as less harm and as less disturbance to plants and animals as we can. The um, scrub is done in the winter. One, because it's warm, it's cooler. Two, the, the scrub plants are all dormant. They've all died off. So, you know, what's alive is underground. We're not disturbing it. We're, we're doing less damage. For the flatwoods, we do that, like we'll be doing that in January and February and March. If we're not doing uh, scrubs kind of in the fall, it would be right now when it's cooler. But the flatwoods, it really doesn't matter. There's so much debris in there. Going in there and taking things out, we're not damaging anything. There's nothing growing underneath it. But we do it after the first of the year because the debris in there is so still soaked from the rainy season if we try to do it in the fall. Why make it harder on ourselves? Why make the trash cans have twice as heavy as they has, have to be? So we do that. Another thing to think about is... Are the birds nesting? If we have, if the birds have started nesting, we shouldn't be out there pulling vines out of trees. So you have to think about everything. You cannot have tunnel vision if you, if I think if you're really trying to do the best job you can, you can go out and do it, but you know, you need to be concerned about everything. How are we doing this? We do it in groups. The majority are coming from Florida Gulf Coast University. Um, Mo, the majority of them are in the, this is for their colloquium class. And if you're not familiar with that course, every student that graduates from FGCU has to take and pass this course. It's all about sustainability. The reason that they put it on is because of where FGCU was built. It was a sensitive area and the environmentalists got right in there. And this was the give back. And I think it, you know, the campus, they're very concerned now green buildings and, and um, sustainability. But this is such an excellent course, because it's not just about sustainability about habitats, it's sustainability for everyday life for at your job. These are things they can take with them and be a better person to help the earth. So it's a service learning. So the service is their volunteer work. Learning is there is an educational, a teaching component to this. So the first day they come, because we do this on weekends, it's easier for everybody to come. The first day, we don't start to work right away. We go out and visit the areas where we've worked so they could see results. This is hard work. And to me, if you can see 
what your effort is going to reap, it's just a lot easier to do. And they're more aware of things and they'll have a lot of questions then because they're really paying attention to the plants and we find all kinds of cool things, different animals, and they really have a good time with, they don't even want to take a break. It's five hours. They just want to keep going. Um, and then the educational part, that's the education on the first day. The second day, they learn about the gopher tortoises, how what they're doing is helping to sustain the habitat for the gopher tortoises, which are keystone sea species. So that passes on to all these other um, species that are depending on the gopher tortoise burrow. So what do they do when they're out there? Well, we're pulling vines out of trees, getting them off the ground. And now the grapevine, you can't just cut these vines off. You have to get them out of the ground. They've been allowed to reproduce so much that just cutting them off is just making them grow more. We have to get them out of the ground. They belong here, but we're trying to get the balance back is what we're trying to do. And we're without herbicides, causing less harm. So they're out there using different tools. She's breaking up that hard debris that's there. Now the ear leaf, um, Greenbrier, Smilex, is a different matter. If you're not familiar with it, it has some nasty thorns on it. In some places, some of it's almost like razor wire. So everybody's wearing leather gloves. And well, to get this out, it's just not roots underground like the grapevine. It has a rhizome that it grows out of and it will re these rhizomes multiply underground. And these have been here for decades. So they'll be in an area, there'll be a clump of them. It can be eight feet across, three, four, five of these deep. And if you see, if you see the roots sticking out of the rhizomes, it looks like big strings coming out. Well, they're like wires, like guide wires, and they're holding it in the ground. They're holding them to each other. So they have to go around and kind of pry at it. And you can't get the whole mass out at once. It, there's no way, we'd have to crane, have a crane in there to get it out. You have to break that up and get it out. But it's well worth the effort. And everybody's really proud when they've worked on one of these and get it out. And they should be, because they worked really hard and they've done something that is super important for the restoration of this property and for the sustainability of the property. So here's something you can do, and this is something the students do. Have you ever tasted the Greenbrier, the new growth, the Smilex? It's really tender. It doesn't have the thorns on it yet. Try it. I'll get several students to be taste testers. We'll find some nice juicy ones there, the new growth, and they'll taste it. And there's about three different things that'll come up that they'll say it tastes like. And I'm not even going to tell you what they are because you've got to go out and try your own. And then um, they think the Calusa used to eat this. And it's pretty good. I snack on it when I'm out there. And then the rhizomes, they think the Calusa used to um, grind those up and make a flower. A modern use you can use for it, we found out these make good batteries. You know how you'll take a potato and make a battery? You can do the same thing with these. It has to be the new growth, the ones that are light colored because they have a higher moisture content. And um, it actually gets 0.8 volts. So it's more than a potato. We cut the saw palmetto fronds off. We normally cut all of them, trim them back, except the last two that are coming out, the two new ones. And a fire now would take them all off. But the, we usually leave the last two because they're not fully extended. And when you cut them off later, that stem will keep growing and you'll have a vine uh, stem sticking up. So here again, saw palmetto, it's got like a hacksaw edge on the stem. So everybody's wearing leather gloves to work with this too. And, and actually long sleeves and they're in the midst of it. In this instance, we didn't trim down as far as we normally do trim as many off because if you look, it has fruit developing on it. So if it has flowers or it has fruit, we do leave more of the fronds. Um, if you see the student down in the front with a pink shirt, she's kneeling down, she's cutting off a stagger bush. A fire, you know, would burn all this off. So stagger bush, beauty berry and that, it's cut off flush with the ground. You don't want to leave a point there that somebody could step on or something that somebody can trip over. And within a week, it will be showing new growth on it already. Then they rake everything up. It's put in trash cans. And in some areas, unfortunately, 
we have to cart it out this way. We cannot bring a dumpster into the preserve because of the wildlife there. And uh, so this takes a lot of time. They have to take this clear up to the parking lot where we have a big open top dumpster. But what we're doing uh, now is we're lucky we're working along the street so we can just have big dumpsters put there on the side, you know, they can open the back up, walk right in and dump it. And they've stomped that down. We want to get as much in there as we can. And they're proud. See, they're proud what they did and they should be. It's a lot of work. And this was in June when we've got it hot. So see the long sleeves? They were working in the saw palmetto. So is all this work worth it? All this hard work? Are we seeing any good results? What's going on? Should we continue this? Well, these are some of the past results. And this goes back to that first photo I showed you, the Flatwoods with the, um, the sleeping bag in that there. That was the first area we tested to see what would happen. And this beautiful morning glory came up, but unfortunately it's not native. So after this photo, you know, out it came, but we had a lot of good stuff come up. There were a lot of grasses is what, seeing things we should see and then the wild penny roll oh my gosh it came up everywhere and it's really important in our flatwoods because it blooms in um december january and sometimes might extend into february there are not a lot of other native flowers in bloom then so this was is super important for all our native pollinators four petal saint john's wort in some areas it came up like grass and this is without ash. Imagine if we would have ash out there, what we would have. And now that was the flatwoods. Now let's look at the scrub, some of the things that came about. Procession flowers, a lot of these came up. This in the scrub, you know, it's just clearing the debris. We don't have as much debris in there, but also when we're raking, we're disturbing the soil. So that helps with germination. Slender leaf clammy weed started showing up in places. Hadn't seen that for a long time. This is a big one, fragrant oringo. Um, I found, if you look on the left, this one was already up pretty far, but I found two of these coming up away from the boardwalk, an area we'd restored. And Ron Eccles has been a volunteer here since the beginning. And he's the one that's kept up the inventory. And he's my to go to guy if I find a plant and I don't know what it is. And he says, wow, we haven't seen that here for more than 10 years. We thought it was gone. So we had two come up and then they bloomed for a couple of years, didn't get very big. And then we had them coming up right next to the boardwalk where everybody could see them and there were all a bunch of them there must have been 10 12 of them coming up and i thought oh great i'll put a sign here putting about restoration and then we'll get lots of volunteers because they'll see all the good things that are happening well good thing i didn't have the sign made because i came back a few days later and there wasn't one of them left what do you think happened the gopher tortoises came through <laughs> They ate them all off. So now we have to protect them to protect. So we're not only protecting the gopher tortoises on the property, we have to protect a lot of our native plants from the gopher tortoises and the rabbits. So, you know, everybody, everybody deserves protection, right? So that one you saw on the left, uh, this was last year. And when it was at that stage you saw earlier, the Picayune fire was burning and we had a lot of ash falling on the property. So I ground some of that up. I might've had a tablespoon full and I put it around the base of this. And then this thing just took off. That big flower stalk came up and it was twice the height as we'd ever seen it here before, just with that little bit of ash. So this is what it looked like last year. The baskets to protect it from the gopher tortoises, by the way. So do you wanna see what it looks like right now this year? Now it's a little bit a hard, little bit hard to tell the size, but from this point to the other point, that's five feet. It put up four stems this year, and here again, I took a little bit of ash, put it around the bit, hardly any at all, and it just took off. And we had have one other one that came up. It's blooming right now, and there were nine other ones coming up that I found early in the year. But the rains, you know, we had a really hot, dry winter this year, and the rains just came too late to save those. I didn't water them. You know, they've got to be strong enough 
to survive the natural conditions. Plus any water I would have, you know, would have chemicals in it if I got water out of a, a spigot. So they have to be able to survive. They have to be able to strong. After all, these plants are going to have to maybe make some changes with what's going on with the warming. So this is a good experiment. And see the fence. We have a bigger, we have a bigger area fenced off now for these. Rough hedge hyssop showed up. It hadn't even been documented as being on the property. It was there for about three years and now we're not seeing it again. I know it's there, but this area has a lot of debris on it again. Ru Rugal's hoary pea showed up and uh, I'm gonna have to fence this in again. I didn't this year and the tortoises ate it off. So I know it's still there. And this is an area next year I'd like to do the experiment with the ash. I think we'll get some really good results here. Then we had Florida milkweed show up. It's not very impressive, is it? As a matter of fact, those leaves are so thin. If you look, there um, are pine needles in there. That'll give you a little bit of um, comparison there. You can see it is hard to spot. It's spindly, it falls over if it isn't growing in something, but I tell you, it makes up for it with the blooms. It hasn't bloomed in a few years. Matter of fact, our little plot of Florida milkweed we have here was included in Kara Driscoll's study that she did uh, for her master's thesis. And uh, because of her work, I'm sure she told everybody, this will be probably, this will, she told me, I saw her a little bit ago, this is gonna be a Florida listed species now is threatened. Um, so here's another reason, shows another reason this property should have been saved, but it doesn't have to be a threatened species in my opinion. Everything we find, no matter how common it is here in Collier County, is important. It just shows another reason that it was a good decision for the city to buy this property and save it. So I asked Kara, she's done with the study on our site pretty much. She's going to come back and tag more things, but um, I'm going to clear this off and burn it burn i have to take it off site to burn it i can't burn here and then probably in june i'm thinking when we would normally have fire starting because of the lightning i'm going to come back and put ash here and see if we can get this to bloom again and see what else happens there so these are more recent results in the scrub this was last a year ago it was in november there was a soft palmetto growing out by uh, 41 covered in grapevine and smilex. There was a big cabbage palm there. It is, was removed before this photograph. There were live oak coming up in there. So we got in there and worked. Here again, it's blooming. So we did not cut the saw palmetto back normally as much as, uh, you know, cut all the fronds off. We left more than two. And that FGCU stand, student standing there is six foot one. So that'll give you a, a little, you can gauge how big this area is. There is a gopher tortoise burrow there in the front. See the sand? That's an active burrow. There was another one in the back that wasn't active anymore. And I imagine it's because the vines just covered everything. There wasn't even a little glimpse of sunlight getting to that burrow. But now there are four active burrows underneath this saw palmetto. But that it wasn't the big surprise. And you can't see the surprise from this viewpoint. So let's go around to the other side of this and see what we have. That is all coming out of one place. This is one saw palmetto. The thing is ancient. It, it could be 500 years old. Chad Washburn was here and saw it and said, yep, it could be 500 years old. Think about it. What, hit, what has it seen in its lifetime? Was it in existence? It would have been small when the Calusa were here. Did it see the Spanish come? Just imagine what this has seen, this saw palmetto. We did find two more old ancient ones. It was um, actually, it's that photo I showed at FGCU students they, in the saw palmetto. There's two of them there and they're large too, but that's a wetter area. So they're probably not as old as this is. But look at, these were probably all over this area and they're gone. The Naples Preserve, when you come here, this is what, was across the street. It's what where the mall was, where Lake Lake Park was a wetter area. But this, you know, all the high areas, it was gone. It's gone except for this. So now people can see what was here. So I went around the area to see what uh, was coming up because we had done areas around there, and I found this flower. 
And uh, turns out it's state listed endangered. Dr. Wilder came out to um, confirm that we had identified this correctly. Austin's Dawnflower is how the state has it listed, but a lot of people call it show, showy Dawnflower. We had a few of them come up. And I noticed that it seemed to be very habitat specific within the scrub. And I looked at the plants that was growing with, because they are very specific where they grow in the scrub. So I went back and looked at other areas in our scrub. And when I got to this one area that we had worked on probably five or six years ago, here they were all over the place. So now I know you're thinking, well, what kind of job is she doing? She's not even paying attention. There's this endangered species there. It's probably been there for five years. She hasn't even noticed it. What, what in the heck is she doing? Good thing you got Andy there because she'll be out there finding all this stuff. Well, this is why I hadn't seen them before. Look at the size. It's a white flower on white sand. It's, look at, that's a penny. And the plant grows, it's entwined in all these other plants. If, unless you're specifically looking for it, you're probably not going to spot it. So this was a big find. There's a close-up of the flower. I want to show you this area. This is in the similar area here. That's the southern slash pine. And you're probably thinking, well, I thought you said the lower limbs die off. What's going on with this one? How can it be a slash pine? Well, one thing, because there's no fire, but the other thing is the limbs are down on the ground because this tree was covered with vines, Smilex and Muscadine grape, especially Smilex. Well, Clark Riles was nice enough to come out because I had some questions. I wanted him to look at some things. If you don't know Clark, he's a senior forester with the state of Florida. And he was all excited about this tree. He said, that's got to be at least 125 years old. And the tape around it again is showing how deep the debris was. And this is, you know, a single pine tree. So this is decades and decades of debris because there's one tree dropping needles, not a mass of trees. But the thing, one of the things I wanted to ask him was, do you notice how it looks like it's sitting on a little hill? I said, I've noticed that all the very old slash pines in here, when we restoring around them, they're sitting up high. They're like on a little hill. I said, did they come in here and, and drag sand out of here, you know, like to build US 41 or what? He said, no, that's not it. He said, the ground has sunk. He said, think about underground being like a sponge. When it's full of water, it's expanded. When you take the water out of it, it compresses. He told me the level of the ground in this area used to be what's at the very base of that tree. And he said, it's going on all over down here because of all the development and the drainage that's going on. So this just, I wanted to show you this to show that no any little thing you do or a major thing, anything you do, there's a ripple effect. So a lot of things we're doing here, we're getting a ripple effect that's good. But look at, there are bad things that happen also. So we decided to measure this just to see how much the drop was. This was only five feet out. It actually drops more if you go farther out. That is a 12 inch drop out here. And it makes sense because this pine, you know, being 125 or plus years old, it was well established when they started draining all in this area and building and expanding the road. And it was established. And the roots, because it had a good root system, that's what's holding it up high. The other trees around there, see how they're low? And the, that flatwoods area, those are younger trees. They're probably about 70 years old. When we cleaned around them, they're all right at ground level. So it makes sense, that is what happened. But I just put this on and wanted to, it really opened my eyes. So um, I'm just hoping to show that everything we do affects something. So this is this year, what we've been working on. This is down there on the very south end. We've taken the cabbage palms out of here. If they, they were still there, you wouldn't even be able to see anything. This was taken end of December into January, beginning of January, so the, Smilex and the grapevine is all kind of dormant. A lot of it's died back, so you can't see how bad this is. But we got in there and worked. It was a lot of hard work. And this is what it looked like when we started to get rainy season. A lot of grasses coming up. 
we had covered a lot of plants too, but a lot of other things came up. So um, let's get the bad stuff out of the way first. <laughs> Rosary pea everywhere. And we have a problem with this anywhere. And there you can see those highly poisonous seeds that it has. Shrubby false buttonweed. This is another problem in the preserve. It's coming up everywhere. So we're pulling these out as soon as we see them. Because a lot of these, um, after the cotyledons, the first leaves that come out, you can actually tell what they are. Another big one is the tropical Mexican clover, you know, Florida snow. Um, we're not going to be able to eradicate this one for sure because of the gopher tortoises. In the winter, they are dependent on this for as a food source because all our native plants have uh, died off. But what our plan is, our aim, what we're gonna to try to do is to keep this out of the areas we're restoring and in the other areas to just keep it under control so it's not taking over. Madagascar periwinkle, a lot of people had this for land. A lot of these are gonna be landscape plants that people had around the houses. Remember, we're surrounded by houses here. Madagascar periwinkle is coming up like grass, hundreds of them. And um, it also can have a white flower. Smooth rattle box is a big problem. A lot of these are coming up. So all these are non-natives. And a lot of these are listed. If you have the list from the state, they have category one and two. A lot of these are listed. Uh, we are required to remove them anyway. Yellow alders, another one. This was a landscape. It gets kind of like a bush. Got a lot of these coming up. And then this one came up and there was only one. So I thought, well, you know, there's only one. So maybe it's something good because it seems like all the bad stuff comes up in the hundreds. But I don't know. I was leery about this one because I had an idea what it could be. But our the rule that we use there, if in doubt, do not pull it out. So we want to make sure because we could discover something new, you know, like that showy uh, that um, Austin's Dawnflower. What if we pulled those out, you know? So I thought, well, we'll wait till it blooms. I marked it so I didn't lose where it was and it bloomed. And even though it's pretty, it doesn't belong here. It's not native. So after the photograph on the left was taken, this plant was removed. So these are bad things. Let's get to so the, all the good things that came up. A lot of white mouth day flower were under all this debris, so they started to flourish. And then this was a surprise, prickly pear cactus. Now these are germinating from seed. See the cotyledons? So they do reproduce by seed. They have, that's the fruit, it's called a pear. So why are these coming up in a group like that though? There were no cactus in this area. How did they get there? Why are they coming up? Why are they in a group? Okay, well, let's think about something here. Let's go back and look. This I'm crediting Ron Eccles for this. This was some of his excellent work. He took a prickly pear, the pear from the prickly pear cactus, cut it open so you can see what the seeds look like. And then he had found this. Gopher tortoise scat. Look at the seeds in it. The gopher tortoises eat the prickly pear. Matter of fact, they eat every part of the prickly pear cactus. So this is how it probably got there. Look at it. It's in a cluster within here. It's got fertilizer too. It's in the scat and look at where they're coming up. So evidently a gopher tortoise had gone through there and made this deposit. So they're doing their job too. They are seed dispersal units. Did you notice on the white fluffy cottony stuff on that. Did you see it around the pear? Does anybody know what that is? Have you ever seen that before? This is something fun to do. I do it with the students. I'm not going to show you yet what it is. I'll take some of that off. Now you got to be careful you don't stick yourself or have a thorn in there. And I have them put it in the palm of their hand, then I have them smash it. Well, when you smash it, it, it looks like there's blood comes out of it. It's this real deep red. And what it is, is there's a little insect in there called cochineal. And it doesn't have, a, it's a soft insect. So it builds this cottony um, nest or whatever you want to call over it to keep it moist, to protect it from the sun. Remember, this is cactus. It's growing out in the dry, hot, in the dry areas out in the hot sun. And this is used as dye, used to be used to be in a lot of our foods, a lot of our drinks, anything that was red. A few years ago, they took it out. 
they were thinking of kids. Well, I don't know. I think I'd rather have red dye from an insect than all these chemicals they're using now. But it's last I knew it was still in yo plate yogurt. If you look in the look at the raspberry, it'll say carmine. And it's also in um, cosmetics. It says carmine, it's this coach, it's cochineal. And they think, you know, the Spanish wanted this part of the world. It wasn't for only for gold, it was for this red dye. They kind of had a monopoly on it. The Europeans couldn't get it, they had to go through the Spanish. So um, it's still in use. They still grow it in Mexico and everything, but the uh, US took it out of a lot of the foods. Oh, so let's move on. This is that area down on 14th, the other part of half of what you just saw previously. And this is before and this is after. So these areas are not fully restored because the trees with the yellow tape are mahogany and all the others except the slash pine you see are live oak. There's some young uh, cabbage palms there. Those are since gone. And there is an area to the left, I should have marked it. If you go see the white flags, if you take the last flag on the left and go farther, we left a lot of grapevine there. Um, it turned out there was a box, Florida box turtle there. And we knew they used this area a lot because of a study that's been done here. So here's another thing we had to think about. We've got box turtles that are gonna need this for the winter. So we didn't like destroy everything. If you say, well, fire does. Yeah, but if you think about a fire in a, a natural area, the animals can move. They move to where there's cover. That's like if we ever did burn this, like the flatwoods, we wouldn't be able to burn it all at once. We would have to leave cover because the animals can't leave and find some other place for cover. So here, that's what I meant about, you have to really, really think about things and uh, be slow so that you're doing things correctly. So we had a nice surprise here, the brown hair snout beam. Um, we knew there were some here, they were on the very edge. It's a vine it grows, but boy, did they take off. They are everywhere now covering the ground and tortoises will eat these. And of course, pollinators come to the flowers. But then when we started, they started growing with the new leaves, we saw this cut out. Have you ever seen this in a leaf? Have you looked at leaves and see sometimes it's an oval shape, sometimes it's round? Do you know what, what causes that? Most people will tell you a caterpillar did that. Well, it wasn't a caterpillar, but it was an insect. It's a leaf cutter bee. So let me blow this up so you can see it better there. I watched one here a couple of weeks ago. They love beautyberry, and that's what the one has the photograph I have. But they'll, I've seen them uh, go for apple. But a few weeks ago, I was watching one at the beautyberry, and you can't film them cutting this. It's like zip, and they've got it. She got it halfway zipped, and then there was something wrong with it. She didn't like it. They're really picky. So what they'll do is they get it, and they roll it up, and they carry it back to their burrow, and they use this for the liner. So they're looking for a specific leaf with specific qualities. We had a lot of corky stem passion flower come up and right away the Gulf fritillary butterflies found them, put their eggs on there. So this is just a tiny plant that you see the larva on. Um, we have two butterflies that can be found in the preserve that this is the host plant for their caterpillars. Gulf fritillary is one. So I want you to take a look at the egg. Remember what it looks like, because I'm going to show you what the other one is. And you'll be able to tell the difference if you see an egg. And that's the zebra heliconian. They used to call them zebra long wings. If you see the eggs here, now this is how to tell them apart. There's a couple things you can do. First of all, the Gulf fritillary will lay its eggs on passion flower wherever it's growing. If it's on the ground, if it's out in the sun, if it's growing up a tree, they're not picky. And they lay single eggs. Lots of times it's on one of the leaves and on the underside. The zebra heliconia is picky. She only wants vines that are in the shade and that are growing up on something. And she lays her eggs in a cluster on the new growth. So even when you, every butterfly egg is different. Uh, the zebra and the um, Gulf fritillary look the same to us, but I know if you got them under a microscope, they would look different and they look different to the butterfly. 
And um, so here's the life cycle of the zebra and the caterpillars when they hatch, like with a lot of butterflies and moths too, when they first hatch out, they do not look like they do later on in the instars after they keep their molting process. So these are a few of the other native plants that came up. And by the way, I didn't show all the exotics and non-natives and everything else that came up, but uh, this is a list. We did have a lot of the partridge pea come up, a lot of the tall elephant's foot, a lot of eastern milk pea. So a lot of things came up. So that's our list. So these students and all our groups, they really crush it every time they come. So that's the end of my presentation. Here's a little bit more about the preserve. And if anybody, has any questions? I don't know. Andy, you want to handle that? I don't know if anybody has any questions or not. Maybe I didn't tweak their uh, curiosity. That was an excellent presentation, Becky. Thank you so much. And I think this is going to be a wonderful reference to have on our YouTube channel for people to watch on demand whenever they need the information. And um, about restoration in particular. And so if you have any questions for Becky, feel free to start typing into the chat. And um, I want to ask the first question. Um, when I first realized that it was all manual restoration happening in the Naples Preserve, it really made me think you know, I bet there's a lot of techniques that you could share for people who have remnant pine flatwoods on their property. I'm not sure how many people might have remnant scrub on their property. Um, there may be a few, um, but is there anything that you would recommend differently or the same if someone wanted to try some of these manual restoration activities on their home property. Okay, the one thing you have to be really careful about, and I forgot to stress that in here, if you have the Southern Slash Pines, they are so sensitive about their roots. And I mentioned how the feeder roots were coming up into the, the malt, into the debris. So those, um, those last slides that area were working, we couldn't even get down to the ground there because we would kill those trees. And when Clark Riles was here, that was one of the first things he said to me. He said, Becky, you're being really careful about those feeder roots, aren't you? And I said, yes. Um, the slash pine, you have to be careful. That's like a lot of people down here will build a house on a lot and they leave a lot of the slash pines. And then after two years, the pines are dying. Well, a lot of it's because all that heavy equipment running over the top of the ground there, packing it down. They might put you know, more uh, soil in there, sand, cover them up more. They are super sensitive. So you have to be really careful. So I think the thing is you can experiment on your property and we didn't go gun ho when we first went in here. We were experimenting, not, you know, how much can we get away with? So we do a little bit this time and then see what would happen and then we would do more. So um, I just, you know, it would be great. You could, no matter, you know, you could really find something fantastic on your property. And it wasn't just plants we found. By doing this, we have been able to document um, which um, glass lizard we had on the property, a spider I didn't think we'd ever find on the property. There are all kinds of things. That's what I meant when the students come. It's an adventure. It's just not hard work. We're, we're learning and they get all excited and, and they'll find something. We share things, you know? So that's what, you know, that's what I tell kids, you know, that's what's great about life is when you can learn something new and exciting every day. So um, I just say, take it, take it slow and make sure what your property was too and, and learn what should be there and what should not be there. Um, on our property, we actually have, um, I believe it's a state listed endangered ground orchid. And I was experiment had one come up in 2003 when they put the boardwalk in. So I went back to an old photograph to figure out where it was. I cleared that area and I put some ash there. I took what was there and burned it at home off site. I put ash there. Nothing came up, but um, it could be I didn't have enough ash or wrong time of year. 
So I might try it again this next year and see if something comes up because I know um, Larry Richardson, who was with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, did a lot with orchids. And Larry had told me that a lot of those ground orchids can survive for 50 or 60 years. Wow. So, you know, there's always planning ahead and, and uh, you know, being hopeful. And we like nice surprises, right, Andy? We do. And that was really excellent advice that you gave about knowing which plant should be present on your particular property. And there is a resource um, that you can use to get started. It may not be your, you know, specific parcel, but you can narrow it down to your zip code by using a website called Natives for Your Neighborhood that is um, run and offered by the Institute for Regional Conservation, which is a South Florida specific organization. So on that website, Natives for Your Neighborhood, you can put in your zip code and it will give you a full list of plants that are native to your particular zip code. So right. It's a good place to start. And that we knew that was, a, even though that had been all destroyed down there on the southern end, we knew it was a scrubby flatwood because very old southern slash pines you know you look at what's what's the oldest thing there the saw palmetto and then the other plants that were coming up there's like black root there are all these other these are all things that would be in a scrubby flatwood so and the problem is where we are we have these two habitats that are right next to each other so you have some overlap it's not like there's this definite line it's um yeah so we have an ecotones happening in areas. Mm -hmm. That's where one plant community changes to another. Yeah. I'm going to read you what we have in the chat since you finished your presentation. Karen says, wow, great talk. Can't wait to see more in person in December. Restoration work at its finest. Wonderful compliment there. Beth says, excellent talk. And Connie says, great presentation and a nice little gem in our backyard. That is the truth. Linda says, thank you, can't wait to visit again. And Becky Troop says, I think spreading ashes from the fireplace might be helpful for scrub, though it's an unnatural scrub. Can I comment on that? Yes, please do. It I would suggest just burning what was around that area, what you actually took off, because the fireplace could have other chemicals in it. You know, if you take something from a grill, charcoal, there's chemicals in it it's not what was there and maybe maybe the plants that are near there need ash from specific plants you know maybe they need ash from the pine needles you don't I mean you know it's all because they've developed they've evolved or adapted to what's there so they might be really specific mm -hmm. about where the ash is coming from I don't know I'm just guessing yeah. but you have to watch we're watching out for chemicals mm-hmm Thank you. And Jay says, this was an amazing presentation. Thank you so much. And Evan says, wonderful presentation. This is in the community where I grew up and means a lot to learn more about it from you. So no questions. I evidently didn't do a good enough job to pique everybody's interest or was it overwhelming? <laughs> and you'll wake up in the middle of the night with a question. <laughs> Well, I think you did a fabulous job. Like, like I said, I think there's techniques that you, um, you know, presented that if people have these remnant habitats on their properties, now they have an idea of, you know, what a big impact just removing layers of built up debris can have in habitats like this and increasing well, the diversity might be there, but it's, you know, hidden in the seeds under the debris. Um, and if anybody does have come up with questions later on, Becky has um, provided us with her email address here. And we have another question from Evan. Any quick thoughts on how the structures were designed and decided upon? We might need some follow up. What kind, which structures, Evan? And you can unmute yourself if that's easier. The boardwalk and the visitor center. Okay, the visitor center was built, um, was one of the first buildings built after Hurricane Donna. 
Hurricane Donna was September 10th, 1960. And the boardwalk, uh, they had like uh, Dr. Reed, who's a well-known botanist and other well-known um, botanists went through the area to um, find what was there. So when they did the boardwalk, it was to, sh they were really sensitive to the areas and what was there when they put the design in and yet needed to put it in so that people could see the areas. So we do have a remnant wet area. You might've seen it on that map that I showed at the beginning. There's nothing to go over there, but that's an entirely different plant community over there. Um, and the thing is for us to do anything out there now, since we're Florida Communities Trust property, for instance, uh, if you've been there within the last year, we have a little area of the boardwalk. We widened it and we have a bench there. It's in the Flatwoods. By the way, it's a great place to sit and watch the birds and everything. We had to go to Florida Communities Trust, give them our proposal. We had to assure them that we weren't harming anything that was there. And we did, we picked it out. It'd be nice to have it here, but if there would have been something there, it would have harmed, we wouldn't have put it there. We have to look at the area. We have to get there okay to do anything. And uh, so they're the ultimate protection. The city's very sensitive to things, but this is like another layer on top of it. Uh, protection for us as taxpayers in case whoever's taking care of the property isn't doing a good job. But the city's, um, the city's really um, worked hard for this and they're really behind this. Uh, we couldn't do it without them. So uh, we're lucky that we have a lot of concern people with the city and a lot of concerned neighbors because a lot of them they um I thought they'd be upset when we took all the cabbage palms out down because on 14th it was solid cabbage palms down there they did it in one day and they were there for several hours so they could get to chipping them and we haven't had one person come up and complain you know what are you doing cutting down trees it's a natural area and it's all because we had it before early it's because of education and that's what people need to remember. You need to educate the public why it's being done, telling why, and then they'll be behind you. And that's what we've got. Um, we put signs out, restoration in progress. So they, they understand what's going on and people come over, they come off the street, and they come and talk to us and they're all excited about what we're doing and wanna learn more. So education is huge. So mm -hmm. if the Native Plant Society has an area that they decide on doing, my advice, well, I know the Botanical Gardens is doing this because they would like to do a burn there. They're doing a lot of education ahead of time. Um, ignorance causes fear with mm -hmm. people. If they know what's going on and why, they'll be behind you. So education is huge. Pre-education, not after you're doing it or when you're doing it. You got to do it before your event. Yeah, that's very important. And we had uh, one more comment from um, Becky Troop. Um, I think this is referencing the Eco Center itself. Was it designed by a student of Frank Lloyd Wright? I don't, there's a lot of um, discrepancy about it. So um, the one they're going with was, it was an architect that um, enamored him or was really liked his. So this building had all the problems that Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings have. Um, people that come by that are architects or have worked on Wright's buildings, the first thing they would come in and ask is how bad does the roof leak? So it wasn't that, he was bad at design. It was that he was way ahead of engineering. They didn't have the materials then. So this building has, the roof has been redone. It's the same design from the outside, but we have all the new products and they changed the engineering on it so it doesn't leak anymore, but it, the design looks the same. So it's just that he was a genius way ahead of his time was the problem. Took a long time for technology to catch up with him. Does that answer your question, Becky, or? I think you did. Yes, that was great. Um, but I have another question, Becky, because um, while you focused on native plants, I know for a fact that you are well-versed in all kinds of uh, nature uh, topics. Uh, including uh, frog and toads and such. Um, 
I was just wondering if you're going to be able to have another adult education program this winter, like you used to offer um, classes, workshops or something like that about every two weeks, I think. Well, we, we normally have nature talks January through Easter on Tuesdays at 10. But because, you know, last year we had to switch to what we're doing right now, Zoom. And this year we're wrestling with it. Um, we're going to have to wait and see. It might end up all being Zoom. I don't know. It's just this building is small. And when we have all these people show up, I mean, we would have to limit it to eight people coming in here. How are we going to do that? So we're going to have to wait and see and play it by ear because the staff here is very sensitive about this virus. We don't want to be spreading it because we really um, love everybody that comes here. They're like family and we don't want to spread it. Uh, so we got to wait and see, but actually you can, um, if you email me, if you don't have it already or Andy can send it to you, she would have it. You can look at last year's programs. They were, they're all on YouTube. And, but if you email us, we will send you the link for all of them. And the thing that worked out good last year, you know, there's good and bad come, came out of this, but last year I could have speakers that were in another state that couldn't be here. And they are really fantastic programs. So this year I'm focusing on people that can do an in-person presentation, but can do virtual if we have to. Cause I've had some speakers tell me they would not do a presentation here unless everybody wears a mask. So, and I respect that. So Becky, we, we're going to have them. It's in our, one of our requirements for Florida Communities Trust, but they may have to be virtual again. We just got to play it by ear. Hopefully we will be able to have Gopher Tortoise Day, which would be in March. We just got to wait and see mm -hmm. what's going Thank on. You. Thank you for asking that question. And we do have another question in the chat from Monica. Have you thought about nativizing the lawn so that portion can be utilized more for pollinators and the other native populations? Well, we do have a pollinator garden that has natives. There's a couple non-natives in it and we're gonna, you know, it needs to be spruced up. We had to redo it here. It is on the Fleshman side of the Eco Center. If you look at that photo of the Naples, it's on that side, the north side. Um, it's got natives in it that don't belong out here. So, you know, if we see them coming up, we're pulling them out because they weren't, they don't, belong, they weren't on this property there. And the reason we put the pollinator garden on the north side is hoping that the building is a block to keep some of it from spreading into the preserve. The grass is um, Mexican cloth. <laughs> So I don't know, we're working, it's bit by bit. A big problem is, and Andy can attest to this is, Andy and I have to take care of all this. So, you know, we're doing things, helping visitors that come and developing programs, trying to do restoration. And there's only so much that we can do. Uh, we don't have, we don't really have many volunteers. Uh, volunteers are a big problem getting them. There's so many places people can volunteer here in Naples. Um, we don't, we need long-term volunteers, adults. We've got some high school students, but they're just, you know, they're working hard, but it's just to get the 60 hours or whatever they need for bright futures, but they're working hard, the ones that are coming. So, um, but we need people that can be here every year and really help us. And you could talk to Andy about that for volunteer, actually go to the city website and you look under employment, job opportunities, and then you'll see it on there, volunteer. My cat wants to be in our program now, so I apologize. This is Lily. <laughs> we have a response from Monica. Thank you, I understand. I was just noticing the lawn in your picture you have on the PowerPoint we are looking at, so. No, it's a good idea, and um, we're making a change right now. The front of the building, we're changing a little bit between the stairs, that's the 41 side. We're making that more of a rain garden to catch more. It's actually a rain garden around the whole building because the roof goes on to planted areas that are elevated. So there's plenty of uh, soil for the water to soak down. But in the front, it's, uh, it's not deep enough and it overflows and is going down the sidewalk into the street. So we're trying to 
work with that problem right now so we don't have runoff into the streets. We're trying to keep it on the property so that it does what it should do, go down through the ground and fill those aquifers. Well, keep in mind that we are going to have an opportunity to visit the Naples Preserve together. So we're looking at Saturday, December 11th. And again, make sure you look at the December newsletter from Naples Native Plants for the link to sign up for our field trip to the Naples Preserve. And who knows, Becky, maybe somebody on the call right now might be a future long-term volunteer. And, and a perk, if they come for the tour, Andy, we'll take them off the boardwalk, won't we? <laughs> yeah, we can do that. It's not allowed. Right. You can see every corner of the Naples Preserve. <laughs> Are we putting them to work, too? <laughs> <laughs> that could be the next step after the field trip. We'll be talking about that. So... I think it's it's about that time to wrap up for this evening. So thank you again, Becky, for this wonderful presentation. And I look forward to continuing to learn more from you about the Naples Preserve. And thank you everybody who chose to attend live this evening. That always means a lot to me. And remember, we'll have the recording on our YouTube channel as soon as possible. So thank you everybody. Have a great rest of your night. We'll see you next time.